Okay, stop me if you've heard this one before. Medieval and Tudor towns and cities were so disgusting that human filth just piled up on the streets. In fact, walking around the streets was dangerous for your health and best to be avoided, as you never knew when a window would open above you, someone would shout, Garde l'eau! And before you knew it, a chamber pot's worth of human waste would fall all over your head. Hole and pooing directly onto the street does have its disadvantages for the passers-by. <laughs> yes, but you have to say it's better than the old days when people used to throw whole buckets of poo out of the window. Mm. <laughs> And your history teacher would wait while everyone in the class giggled and go ew, and then move on to talking about how no one ever washed ever and that's a myth I've already flushed into non-existence did you see what I did there but I wanted to continue talking about hygiene and start the new year by talking about butt stuff after all so so many things have gone to shit so let's talk about how the Tudors got rid of it and what they thought about the general concept of butular hygiene. The role of smell in health was previously discussed in my video about the Tudors and bathing. Check it in the description below. But I'll go over a few key ideas. People in the 16th century generally believed that miasmas, foul vapours, carry disease into the body as you breathe them in. Bad smells could literally kill you, which isn't a terrible idea in principle. Things that are rotten or covered in germs generally do smell really bad, and keeping yourself and your home clean smelling involved processes that often killed germs that Tudor housewives could just possibly not know about. They had no way of knowing about them. So Tudor Britons would try and keep away from things that were foul smelling. But there's one smell that they really couldn't get away from or deal with easily. Toilets. Tudors really hate the smell from latrines. Andrew Board, notable doctor, correctly believes that stinking poorly kept toilets make people ill. Sure, he thinks it's stinking air, but the link between dirt, human waste and disease was known, if not scientifically understood. Sir so John Harrington wrote that smoke and the smell of toilets are two of those pains of hell and therefore I have endeavoured in my poor buildings to avoid those two inconveniences as much as I may. Tudors are very aware that toilets need to be kept clean or they'll have an impact on the life and health of those in the household. And this is difficult in a world with limited plumbing, limited access to clean water, limited space and extended households. They had to come up with ways to stay fresh and hygienic that worked in the confines of 16th century life. So let's talk through the different ways the different classes dealt with their waste. Labourers, farmers, yeomen who lived either in relative rural isolation or in hamlets and villages had a lot of freedom about, you know, how they did the business, relatively speaking, but conditions would be what we would call basic. Houses and villages would generally have a jakes outside at the end of the garden. The jakes is a toilet that's a plank of wood, it's got a big hole in the middle, placed over a cesspit. A very basic bog standard outhouse. The cesspit will either be just a toilet pit that you fill in and you cover up and you dig a new one when you can't fill it up anymore, you move the outhouse you know, along the way, or the toilet pit will be built so that water waste drains away into the soil while solids that land inside compost with the soil until you want to clean them out and reuse your pit all over again. Obviously, the outside toilet has some downsides. It's not especially hygienic and it does mean the occupants of the house have to climb out into the very cold, cold, very dark night if they're desperate for a piss around three in the morning. However, the distance from the house means that smells are kept away from the inhabitants, waste isn't in the house, and it can naturally decompose into the soil, and you've got sort of a bit of privacy. The outdoors often had an association with greater privacy. After all, a Tudor home has limited space, and people have to share nearly everything. 
In the poorest homes in the countryside, a Tudor farmer could give themselves private space that their equivalent or those of higher rank in a town and city just might not have. Plus, you've always got the option of just like peeing in a bush. Going to the toilet in the open was very common for men and some women and that's the beauty of living in the countryside. Could you just pee in public in Tudor towns? Well, yeah, people did. Much like people still do now on a Saturday night outside the club. People will pee nearly everywhere that they get the chance. And things are no different 500 years ago. Men will happily pee or defecate in fireplaces at inns or in their friends' houses if you don't give them a chamber pot. And they will just go in the street or in gutters if they can get away with it. However... It's wrong to assume that because people did it, that meant that society accepted that. In fact, local government in Tudor towns and cities were pretty harsh on instances of public waste. It is absolutely against the law to piss in the street or throw out the waste from your chamber pot and your neighbours will absolutely report you to the civic authorities. Because miasmic waste is seen as a public health hazard and it's a finable offence about 40p, which is about a week's worth of wages. And if the local authorities couldn't find out who the person responsible for the big pile of shit is, they will fine every household in the vicinity as punishment. But from the perspective of town councils, they spend a lot of public funds on building public toilets for their inhabitants and you gotta use them. The toilets are open, they're communal, but you have separate buildings for men and women, with the waste falling into gutters or straight into the town's river as it flows outside of city limits. It was a matter of public health, especially as town populations began to grow over the 16th century, and public toilets are a sign of modern urban progress. Within the sprawling homes and tenements of towns and cities like London, Norwich and Bristol, it was increasingly common for households to have indoor toilets. Not everyone, that is certainly for sure, but outside space could have better uses. And it ran the risk of being inspected, being fined by those local authorities, so those with the money to do so had toilets within their home. In a world where life is lived in public space, the act of withdrawing to a private room to be on your own is a public declaration of status, that you have the money, the space, the time to even do so, unlike those plebs down the road. Indoor privies consisted of a small room behind a closed door or perhaps adjoining a chamber with a seat leading to a chute that emptied into a pit, a drain or a moat, stopped over with a lid or a cushion so smells don't get out. There were specific laws that prevented houses from allowing their toilets to dump into the town gutters and Andrew Board recommended having privies empty over flowing water to efficiently remove all waste. Many indoor privies in urban environments emptied into internal cesspits, often built under cellars or under the front room or even shared between houses and a significant proportion were cleaned out by water collected in rainwater cisterns that would stop gutters and pipes from being blocked. There's this particularly hilarious case that I found that was referred to the London size regarding pipes. A certain lady called Alice Wade was reported to the courts for rigging up her sewage pipe to empty into the cistern that her neighbour used to flush their toilet. So th this is the official rec record of the case. Whereas of old in the parish of St Michael Queenhive, a gutter running under certain of the houses was provided to receive the rainwater and other water draining from the houses, gutters and street, so that the flow might cleanse the privy on the hive. Alice Wade has made a wooden pipe connecting the seat of the privy in her solar with the gutter, which is frequently stopped up by the filth therefrom, and the neighbours under whose houses the gutter runs are greatly inconvenienced by the stench. Judgment that she removed the pipe within 40 days. I mean, Alice Wade is eternal, and I'm so thankful for it. So thankful for her giant shit. Shared cisterns and shared outdoor privies were often at the focus of disputes between neighbours, which proves that 
nothing ever really changes. The smell, the condition and the cost for cleaning were all reasons for dispute. There's a notable case between Henry Dolphin and John Dimmock, who had indoor privies in their individual houses that shared a single cesspit. Dolphin's home had just one stool, so one toilet, but Dimmock's had three. The point of contention was that the pit was accessed and had to be cleaned out through Dolphin's home, even though he only made a relatively small amount of the waste. The London viewers, a committee of men that could be seen as the Tudor equivalent of mediators, had to be called in. They decided that Dolphin's responsibility to clean the system was, to him and all his house, a great annoyance, being no less than 30 ton. So Dimmock needed to pay his fair share to have it cleaned. The use of privies and how they were used was a matter of public awareness and knowledge. Once your cesspit has gotten a bit ripe, it's time to call in the cleaners. And it wasn't just a matter of the smell, cesspits could be very dangerous. In the summer, the smell could make people ill, or cheapskates might put off getting it emptied as long as they could, which is a bit of a, a gamble because the, the, the water, the what's in the cesspit, can impact the structural integrity of the house. Grossly put, the liquid in the cesspit spills up and rises, especially if it's under your house, so it soaks the floorboards and beams, rottening them, weakening them, and they eventually give way, sending belongings, furniture and people straight down into that cesspit. There's a particularly gruesome instance of this happening in the London Coroner's Roll of 1326. A certain man named Richard the Raker is sat on his privy, which was overflowing, and the rotten boards collapsed underneath him. In the words of the coroner, he did drown in a dreadful manner. To prevent this, cesspits had to be regularly emptied by select freelance contractors. The nightmen, the gold diggers, the dunnymen, the gong farmers, the gong scourers. These were your professional cesspit emptiers that you would hire every year or so to empty your pit. So there's two ways you can go about this. Alright, I'll give you a quote. There's two ways you can go about this. One way is to access the cesspit through a side tunnel. You break through the wooden planks and bricks that make up the sides of your pit, you cart it out and you rebuild it afterwards. Now the other way is a bit more dangerous. You send down a hole man, lowered by a rope man. He fills up tubs with waste, he gets dragged out. The tub men clear out the waste into a waiting cart. Now once your cesspit is empty, the gong farmers would take it outside outside the town limits to a designated waste area or tip it into the downstream river. By law this work can only be done at night and there are various rules and regulations governing the work of the nightmen. It's tough and dangerous work with nightmen at risk of suffocating or drowning in cesspits or occasionally finding the bodies of murder victims or unwanted babies hidden in pits. And they weren't allowed to just slack off. So at the end of the day, when you've filled that car up, you can't just dump it wherever you want in public drains or gutters or fountains. One London gong farmer who was caught pouring human waste into a public drain was put into one of his tubs, filled up to his neck with filth from his work, and displayed in Golden Lane with a big sign detailing his crime so that he would never do it again. It puts customer complaint procedures in the 21st century into a whole new light, doesn't it? The act of relieving oneself is shaped by the expectations of refinement and class. Those in the highest classes of society give themselves the public act of privacy when they go to the toilet. It is not for them, the close confined communal toilets of their servants, who go to places such as the two-storey great houses of easement at Hampton Court that has 28 seats. For gentlemen and ladies must give themselves the privilege and the luxury of being alone as they piss. The rich kept close stools, so chamber pots, in their private chambers. See that I lack not by my bedside a chair of easement with a vessel under and a urinal by, says William Horman, headmaster of Eton in the Vulgaria published in 1519. These close stools and urinals are emptied by servants and put away when not in use. 
These are particularly used by the great women of Tudor England. Their male peers, no matter their wealth and status, can look upon the hedge, i.e. they can piss wherever they wanted to, no problem, because they're blokes, right? But women of position don't have that freedom, not only because of status, but the elite fashions they wore prevented them from just, you know, squatting out on the grass verge, doing what poor women did. So John Harrington wrote that your milkmaids and country housewives may walk to the woods to gather strawberries, etc. But great estates cannot do so, and therefore for them it is a commodities more than I will speak of. And yes, let's talk about John Harrington. Unlike those country folks who have their toilet pits and the urban poor with their communal cesspits, country houses and palaces have a particular problem. So they have communal servant toilets, they might have a jakes, they will have those chamber pots filled with the rarefied waste of the social elite, and all these get dumped into the same big toilet pit. A big estate, like the palaces that house royalty, could be home to up to a thousand people, and a thousand people emptying their bowels into the same toilet pit causes a problem very quickly. Even in the goodliest and stateliest palaces of this realm, notwithstanding all our provisions of vaults, of sluices, of grates, of panes of poor folk sweeping and scouring, yet still this same hoarse and saucy stink, John Harrington wrote, expressing frustration at the smell that came from musty toilet pits, a problem semi-caused by his own wealth and status. He famously invented the forerunner to the modern flush toilets. Like those simple urban privies that were cleaned out by rainwater cisterns, Harrington's toilet had a flush valve to let water out of a tank and a wash-down design to empty the bowl. He did inspire a trend for this new style toilet, with Elizabeth I having them installed in all her palaces, but his budding career in plumbing came to a swift flushing decline. Despite being Elizabeth's godson, he frequently infuriated her from supporting the treasonous actions of the Earl of Essex to translating the racy and rude poem Orlando Furioso to his book that promoted his toilet in 1596. A new discourse upon a stale subject, the metamorphosis of Ajax, is not only a pun about toilets, Ajax, Ajax, <laughs> but the book is actually a political treatise about how the filth that's clogging up Elizabeth's court should be flushed away. And she didn't particularly care to be told any of this. In any case, Harrington wasn't the first Tudor to recognise the importance of good drainage systems. There were many noble families who had plumbing of, of a kind installed in their homes. So William Petra's home of Ingate Stone Hall had tap controlled water, sewage pipes that drained waste away underground and specially built inspection chambers so that his household staff could maintain and oversee the whole system. And he wasn't the only one. Hampton Court in particular had a very complicated system of water purification and sewage drainage. I'm standing on Coombe Hill in Kingston upon Thames where Henry VIII built three conduit houses in order to collect spring water and channel it down to Hampton Court. And from here the water was channeled the 18,000 feet towards the palace. His engineers had worked out that the fall between the springs up on the hill here and the palace was over 129 feet, easily enough to provide him with high pressure running water at second floor level. In the upper chamber there's a lead tank in which the spring water is initially collected. One of the remarkable things about Coombe Conduit is that after 450 years, fresh water is still running into it. From this first collection tank, a lead pipe runs via this corridor beneath my feet to a second tank which is designed to allow settlement. The reason, of course, that we're underground is that Henry VIII's engineers had, as part of their brief, the fact that the water supply should be absolutely secure. The king couldn't take any risks that anyone should come in and try and poison it. And if you look in the water in this tank today, it's as clear as it was in the reign of Henry VIII. The guard robes were cleaned by a special breed of Tudor contract cleaner called the Gong Scourers. Those appointed by the king were responsible for maintaining the sewers and guard robes of all the royal palaces within a 20 mile radius of London. I'm now standing in the bottom of a Tudor cesspit. 
and immediately above my head in the 16th century, there would have been a wooden guardrobe seat. Just to its right here, on the first floor, there'd have been a second one. And they both discharged via brick shafts into the chamber in which I'm standing. Now, there were two sorts of chambers at Hampton Court in the 16th century. Some of them were flushed by water, and others, just like this one, were left sealed for the entire period that the court was in residence. After the court had been here for about four weeks, a chamber like this would have probably been full up to about here. Not a particularly nice place to be. But, of course, the gong scourers had to get into here and clean it out when the court had left. And they obtained access through this arch here, which connected with the outside world. They'd have broken a hole on the outside, they'd have come in, they'd have scrubbed the interior, bricked up the hole, and left this chamber ready for the next visit of the court. And speaking of Henry VIII's paranoia about water purity, let's get to the main meat of this video that you've all been waiting for and talk about Henry VIII's toilet habits. The groom of the stool. A much maligned job. I've heard a lot of bad takes and oh, awful jokes from people about this particular role and I'm here to correct you all on your terrible opinions. The position of the groom of the stool was introduced by Henry VII and remained a fixture at British court until 1901. The job was an import from the French court where Henry VII grew up and was part of the Tudor expansion of the role of privy chamber as a section in its own right of government. In the words of Francis Bacon, Henry VII was intent on keeping distance, not admitting any near or full approach, either to his power or to his secrets. The privy chambers were the private lodgings of the monarch. The public presence of the monarch was seen and interacted with the world in the outer chamber, the presence chamber, but they could retire to their private rooms, which had a library, bedroom, study and stool chamber. Technically, anyone can go to court, but only certain people are allowed into the presence of the king, and even fewer still are allowed into the intimate company within the rooms of the king. To be appointed to the privy chamber meant you had been personally chosen by Henry and were granted the executive power to execute verbal commands given by him. Why is this important? Well, think back to those urban toilet users giving themselves the public performance of withdrawal. The monarch is everything to the state in the 16th century. Their body literally personifies it and they rule it personally as a divine being appointed by God. The elaborate ceremony adds this ritual element to the appearance of the king, to their very being. It creates a layer of magisterial distance between themselves and their subjects. Access to the king is difficult, which means that courtiers must compete with each other to impress and gain influence with him. So, in theory, discourages factionalism as everyone's too busy conspiring against each other to gain access to these chambers to hopefully avoid plotting against this usurper dynasty. The earliest reference to the groom of the stool is in a warrant of the great wardrobe on the 15th of November 1497, but John Russell's Book of Nurture from 1452 details out the key duties of a groom of the stool. The groom must see the privy house for easement be fair, sweet and clean, and that the boards thereupon be covered with cloth fair and green, which means new and fresh rather than the colour, and the whole himself, look there no board be seen, thereon a fair cushion, the ordure no mean to vex, look there be blanket, cotton or linen to wipe the never end, and ever he calls, wait ready and prompt, basin and ewer, and on your shoulder a towel. The grooms for Henry were responsible for the maintenance and transport of Henry VIII's close stools and for attending to Henry as he used it. Henry's close stools were made from pewter, covered in embroidered velvet, stuffed with swan's down and studded with gilt nails. So the king, Henry VIII, he used something called the close stool. This one is quite a lot later, but you get the idea. It's a padded seat placed over the chamber pot, which is in there, 
We know that Henry had one which was padded with swan's down. It was decorated with fringes and 2,000 gilt nails. It must have been spectacular. These would be used in Henry's stool chambers that he had installed at each of his palaces, which were built and reserved for his sole use. His chambers were decorated with pictures and he kept bookshelves in there so that he had something to read as he went although Henry also kept a night stool and a urinal for use as he slept. Whatever Henry produced during the night would be checked over by his groom and by one of his four cycling private physicians every morning. Henry VIII was intensely paranoid about disease, not unwisely and not without reason. He was the most timid person in such matters you could meet, according to the French ambassador, and the groom of the stool played a crucial role in helping with Henry's health. Henry got um he got constipated a lot and he often needed to pee a lot he drank a lot of red wine so the groom is on hand to help administer enemas and make sure that henry's bowels and other functions are working the groom had to attend the king at any time of day and whenever he was needed the groom's lodgings were actually directly beneath henry's rooms in each palace linked by a private staircase beyond attending to henry while he used the clothes stool the groom was one of the highest ranked servants in the privy chamber. He's responsible for the items that Henry uses personally on a day-to-day -day basis. He's responsible for the linen, so his shirt, his nightgowns, his, his stockings, all that stuff, and for the furnishings and equipment in the royal apartment. He's in charge of Henry's jewels, the plate in daily use, and Henry's secretarial duties. The groom is also keeper of the privy purse, so he has financial responsibility for the royal household. The groom was essential to the proper function of Henry's household. So Henry only selected men of the very highest rank and those he actually liked and got on with. His groom must have a vigilant and revered respect and eye to his majesty, so that by his look and countenance, they may know what lacketh or is his pleasure to be had or done. And yes, for those who make the stupid jokes out there, the groom did have to clean Henry's bottom after he'd been to the toilet. But being the groom is the most highly respected and influential job you can have at court. The groom spends the most time with Henry out of anyone, even his wives. And the groom is one of a very small amount of people who are physically allowed to touch Henry. Because Henry VIII wasn't a regular person we can look at him and people try to analyze him as we would someone as a modern person but he's not a regular person he is a king he is a majesty he is a divine being of god he was anointed during his coronation which means that the holy spirit kind of lives inside him his body is holy and divine only certain people were permitted to touch his body and the groom is one of them he had to be a man of absolute integrity of the purest status of incorruptibility of absolute trust as the holy power of the king diffuses into his being through touch the groom is almost part of the body politic and in his support and administration of henry's earthly body to maintain his heavenly one. And that's why the groom in the stool is not just a punchline of a lazy joke, thank you very much. Going to the toilet was so often a public experience for people in the 16th century. The idea of privacy and personal space was so fundamentally different from our own. It was normal for people to live closely together in shared spaces. So completely normal to have and use a chamber pot or to just go to the toilet in front and full view of other people. Access to private space is controlled by status. Your privy might be the only private space in the whole house, but on the only people able to relieve themselves in such places are those are those who can grant themselves the luxury of solitude. And talking about luxury, let's talk about money because much like the ability to be clean and hygienic, it's all about affordability. If people can afford to remove smells and waste, they will. 
For those labourers struggling in rural poverty or widowed women with multiple children spinning for pennies and living on the poor rate in urban squalor, getting a toilet inside your house or cleaning the cesspit is not the economic priority. To build a water closet with a rainwater system or those newfangled political flushing systems, you need access to your own gutters, your own drains, a water supply, and that's on top of the costs of one pound, 10 shillings and eight pence for it to be installed in your house. That is a full month's salary for a well-to-do tradesman. So that is far out of the price range of most people. Even maintaining a cesspit is expensive. True, the costs are spread over a few houses and a few families and you don't have to do it every year, but it's still a big thing to budget for. The average household latrine is up to 16 tonnes of waste will be dug out over two nights. You have to pay the wages of a team of at least four men, pay for the barrels they use, their food, the candles they use because they can't work in the day, juniper and fragrant herbs to freshen the pit, the brickwork and the wooden structure of the pit to be rebuilt, and for someone to clean up the house after the gong farmers have dragged out all your shit. Average estimate for the work was, based on the few figures I saw bandied about in texts, somewhere in the region of two pounds, the equivalent of 132 days of work for a labourer. With costs like that, it's a bit more understandable why people left their cesspits so long their floorboards and toilet seats rotted away. Certainly, being zipped to the 1550s and needing to have a wee would be a big shock to our modern sensibilities. Toilets were simply not as hygienic as we would like them today. However, People in Tudor England knew and understood that human waste spread disease and they made all the attempts they could to keep themselves safe and their homes clean. This idea that people 500 years ago were happy to live in filth simply isn't true. As I said in my video on the Tudors and bathing, living hygienically is intrinsically linked with poverty. So let's consider a building of multiple occupancy in London across two centuries. A two-storey Tudor-style house in 1550 could be, let's say, home to two families. A couple with three children and an apprentice on one floor and a blended family, so a remarried couple, and six children from their respective marriages on the floor above. Their outside toilet is used by about 14 people and they live in a city of around 200,000 inhabitants. The pressure for water is limited, public fountains and public drains are available, public toilets are free and paid for by the local authorities of the city. A four-storey building in 1850 in the same spot is part of a very different London. There are now three million people who live in the city and that's a lot of strain on toilets and water. The four-storey building is slum housing with a single outside toilet serving the 100 people who live in cramped, confined conditions. Access to public water is severely limited. The local authorities have a laissez-faire, so hey, society is naturally self-regulating and people can improve their own situations, right? It's an easy attitude to take when the working poor do not vote and are legally not allowed to do so and cannot change their living conditions legally. Water from public fountains and pumps is only allowed to flow for an hour a day and the system of gutters and rainwater systems used by their Tudor ancestors has lapsed. It's been destroyed, it's been renovated and removed by subsequent generations. There are no more free public toilets and the gong farmers now leave their waste in heaps on the city streets. The cesspits and toilet pits of before are still used but the maintenance isn't there. In four years time a crack in a cesspit will leak waste into the water supply of the Broad Street pump. The outbreak of infectious cholera will help develop germ theory, but is that really a consolation to the 700 people who died from dirty water, or to the over 14,000 people who died as a result of the local government dumping raw sewage straight into the river and contaminating the water supply for the entire city? The deaths did lead to a wider understanding of public health and the government suggested reforms to improve the hygienic conditions of the urban poor. But these reforms were voluntary for councils to undertake, 
After all, who wants to pay extra taxes so the poor can have toilets and, like, proper sewage pipes? Until the 1875 Public Health Act brought in requirements for councils to provide water, drainage, sewage systems, and the Artisans' Dwelling Act made allowances for councils to clear slums that kept people living in these conditions. I did say allowances. The law didn't force anyone to do anything, and while some areas took public health very seriously, there were many others who didn't want to waste their money on something as paltry as improving slum life. Those Victorian slums are still standing as Britain goes through the Blitz, and they are still standing into the 1960s, when the British government finally demolishes them and clears out those slums. Some of them, even to the end of the 1960s, still did not have water, plumbing and proper drainage. The slums were replaced with council housing and the high-rises that become synonymous with the skyscape of British cities. And this is not to dismiss high-rise city blocks. They were an investment in people's futures to create a standard level of personal living and community connections that still to this day support so many people in my country. The problems come when, as with the problems with the Broad Street water pump, the local authorities fail in their due diligence and let people suffer. When money is scrimped and local authorities value their bottom line and their own pockets above the lives of those who depend on them. Sure, this is about toilets and making jokes about turds and laughing at Henry VIII reading on the toilet. But lack of access to proper hygiene and proper living standards is an ongoing issue of modern poverty. It is poverty that keeps people in slums and it is poverty that keeps people in living situations that directly harm their health. The idea that the Tudors lived happily and ignorantly in filth is a modern myth that presents a version of the past that ensures people in the now have to be happy about what they've been given. Individual choices and actions, as in the 16th century as now, are dependent and made based on the contextual systems that govern our lives. Ultimately, even a chamber pot is never just a chamber pot. Uh, my recording and editing have been a little delayed this month, so sorry for that. Uh, the Christmas and New Year period have been pretty hard for me at home. So I, I had a family bereavement right at the start of Christmas, and I had personally, I had I was in hospital to start off my 2020, which was a lot of fun for me. But um, I wanted to particularly thank a few of the vital sources without whom this video wouldn't have been possible. Uh, so the Tudor Society is a great resource in general, but big thanks for them for having John Harrington's, John Harrington's um, Metamorphoses of Ajax up as a PDF that you can just read. So check it out for clear details on how to build your very own Tudor. Tracy Borman's The Private Lives of the Tudors uh, has a very detailed section on the groom of the stool. And it's really vibrant and it's a really great informative read on the sides of Tudor life that don't really get a lot of focus. Todayifoundout.com had all the wonderful nuggets of toilet related deaths in the London coroner notes. So thanks for your tireless dedication to toilet history. And uh, finally, I wanted to draw special attention to Mary Thomas Crane's Illicit Privacy in Outdoor Spaces in Early Modern England printed in the Journal for Early Modern Studies in their 2009 number one volume nine uh, journal issue. Uh, it was a totally random JSTOR find as most useful things on JSTOR are because their system doesn't work very well. But it was a really fascinating read of philosophy, history, getting a, a really lovely insight to the worldly context of the 16th century perspective. It was really beautifully written, really engaging. Uh, I'm very grateful for this work being out in the world, so definitely track it down if you can. If you enjoyed my work today, please consider giving me a one-time donation on coffee or even contributing to my future work by browsing my research wish list on Amazon. Like, share, ring the bell, and I'll see you next month. 
hopefully and not literally but figuratively and for the truly curious people in the 16th century used wool cotton or linen wipes for their anal hygiene and there are debates as to whether those were thrown away or washed and reused they did also have a form of toilet paper but that would be sort of cheap writing paper or cheap pamphlet paper that you could just repurpose to clean your bum and they probably used just about anything that didn't damage or rip apart your private parts and now you know